<laughs> all right, so when I first turned 21, I was really sure that I was gonna be a wine drinker. Um, my parents gave me all these like wine cups. I got wine for dummies. So you can imagine my surprise when I sat down with my very first bottle of wine. I poured it into one of my new cups. I had some fancy little thing that you used on the way there, and I didn't get it. Like, I read Wine for Dummies. I thought that this was gonna make sense to me. Um, so I kind of decided at that point that wine was something that I was gonna enjoy, but it was never something that I could be truly passionate about. At the same time, I never really thought that I was gonna be much of a beer person either. Um, beer to me was some fizzy liquid with a really bitter, weird aftertaste. Um, so you can imagine my surprise again when my fa I found myself on a sunny Colorado afternoon at a local brewery, um, and I fell in love not with the beer, but the beer culture. So the conversations people were having, the way they were excited about this, this fizzy liquid. Um, and I decided at that point that beer was going to be something that I truly liked. So I set out to find a beer that I enjoyed. It didn't take too long. I found one that's called a Belgian Double, and it tasted like chocolate and bananas. And I thought, you know, if, if I can find a beer that tastes like Chunky Monkey ice cream, I think I'm gonna be pretty good at beer. <laughs> so the rest is history, and I'm really excited to be here speaking to you today about a couple of the things that I think make beer a truly great beverage. We're gonna talk about the science, kind of the art and creativity, a little bit of history, and then also how beer is a little bit like yoga. So to start, um, beer truly is a science, and not only because it's had a periodic table made out of it, but because it's an incredible, intricate process. So I like to think about beer, it's kind of to simplify it down, what we want to do is get a sugar source. So a sugar source, what we do is we give that to a yeast, a yeast takes that sugar and turns it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So alcohol, we all appreciate alcohol in beer, and carbon dioxide is what gives it its bubbles. So wine, we can think of this, wine is also a fermentation. Um, wine takes grapes and turns them into alcohol. And if you've ever had a grape, which I hope some of you have, you know that grapes are pretty sweet. So imagine yourself now, you're chewing a grape, you get that sugar feeling on your tongue. Um, so it's pretty easy to think how grapes turn into wine. However, if we start with how we make beer, we use barley. Um, barley is something you might have had for breakfast. If you've had it for breakfast, you know it's not very sweet. And if you've had it before you've cooked it, you know that it's not even really edible. It's kind of hard to chew on. So our goal as brewers is to take something that's not even edible, and turn it into something that we can give to yeast to make alcohol and carbon dioxide. So I like to think of this whole situation, the brewing process, as we have sugar inside of the barley. It's in this tiny little gift box, but it's also wrapped in like 50 other boxes, and we have to go through a whole lot of work to get to what we really want. So the first step in making beer is taking barley and putting it through what's called the malting process. What this does is it turns the beer, or the, turns the malt a bunch of different colors, which um, later on the line lives, lends to beer um, color and a couple of different flavors, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, once we have the malt, we add it to water at a very specific temperature for a very specific amount of time. This starts to unwrap a couple more of those boxes we were talking about, and we get closer to our end goal. And finally, myself as a biochemist, I get really excited about this. The thing that opens the last couple of boxes are enzymes. And these enzymes take our starch source and they turn it into sugar, which is something that the yeast can use and we're really excited about that. So if you've had beer, you know that a lot of the times it can be a little bit bitter, has some characteristic aromas, and where this comes from is hops. So hops are a flower. Actually, when I was a little kid, my dad had a hop vine um, and he also had a grapevine. So as a little kid, I was pretty excited about something that I could eat and not very excited about something that I couldn't eat. So I didn't really like hops until I was probably about 21, um, but I have a really, a really appreciate and respect for them as we speak. Um, so we add hops to beer. It's another really amazing chemical reaction that happens when you boil it. And then finally, we have our sweet liquid with bitterness added and a characteristic aroma, and we give that to the yeast. So pretty complicated already. However, once we give it to the yeast, things get a little crazier. So <laughs> believe me, if you guys cared that much, we would spend the next like 15 or so minutes deconvoluting this whole thing, because that's how much I love metabolism. But what this is, <laughs> we're not gonna do that. <laughs> um, just to show you that this is a truly complicated process. So we simplify it by saying yeast takes sugar and turns it into carbon dioxide and alcohol, but truly, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on at the same time. So we can imagine sugar as one of these little dots, carbon dioxide is another dot, yeast, or alcohol is another dot, but you can see as it goes down this pathway, there are so many different directions it can go. So depending on the yeast mood, so if it has too many neighbors or too few, 
if there's too much oxygen or too little, if it's too hot or too cold, it's gonna send all of these dots in different directions. Um, and to add to that complication, each of these has a potential to be flavor active. So depending on how the yeast feels while it's fermenting, you get totally different flavors in the beer. So yeast truly is um, a really complicated organism and it adds to the scientific aspect of making beer. So finally, even once we get the beer totally done and in the package, there's been so much research that goes into saying like, what, what is this foam head on top of beer? What, what makes that up? What makes it good? What makes it bad? And then similarly looking into the color um, and also the clarity. So if things are really fuzzy looking, that's not usually a good looking beer. So understanding what it is along the process that makes these things happen. So really the reason that we love beer is because of its flavor, right? Yes? <laughs> I love beer because of its flavor. Um, and this is something that we call in the science world sensory. And you can imagine this a lot with wine. So people, they have their wine glass, they're swirling it around. They take a nice smell. Um, maybe they spit it out after they drink it. We don't really do that in the beer world. But we do a lot of similar stuff. Um, so whether it's happening in a brewing science laboratory, whether it's happening among friends or at a guided tasting, people are getting more and more interested in the flavor of beer. So as I said, when I tasted wine, I didn't really get it. I could never really get past the fact that it tasted like fermented, gra fermented grapes. Excuse me. Um, but for beer, there's so many different flavors and aromas that come out of the process. And where this really comes from is the raw ingredients. So we talked a little bit about these. Um, first of all, barley, we talked about it goes through a malting process. It turns a bunch of different colors. But what this also does is it creates flavor compounds. So if you have a really light colored beer, it's gonna taste more like canned corn, which can be good, believe me. Um, if you have a darker beer, it's gonna taste like coffee or chocolate. Anything in between has totally different flavor profiles. Um, even if you look at hops, there's a lot of different varieties of hops that are coming up every single day. Some of them smell like melons, some of them smell like tropical fruit. Others are more classical, smelling like citrus and pine. So this is a pretty amazing option for creativity when it comes to picking your raw ingredients. Even the water has a really profound impact on, um, on the beer flavor. And as we already talked about, the yeast can create so many different compounds that can make the beer good or not very good at all. So this is where I think beer truly becomes a creative art. So it's like making a recipe. You take things, you put them together, and you have a desired outcome. Um, and I, I teach a brewing lab, and I always tell the students that you know, you do your best, we understand what's happening as far as this being a science, but what beer truly is, is an art. You put things together, you hope it's gonna turn out a certain way, but at some point you just have to give it up to being super creative. So besides being a creative art, um, beer is also a worldwide culture. So if you go to different places in the world, you'll find out that their beers are totally different. Um, so for example, if you were to go to Germany, you'll see that they have what's called the Reinheitsgebot, which is the German purity law. And this says that they can only have barley, hops, water, and yeast in their beer. Um, and that's pretty cool. But what that ends up doing is it makes a whole bunch of different, um, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, so water, barley, hops, and yeast. And even with only these four ingredients, it creates a whole different array of different beers. If you go over to Belgium, you find that they add anything from um, different citrus fruits to herbs to spices, and they have a whole different array of beers as well. If you go down to China, um, you understand that they have a huge agriculture based around rice, and even in South Africa, they do a lot of work with sorghum, sorghum being a gluten-free additive to beer. Um, even in the United States, I'm going from coast to coast, you'll find that they actually have different understandings of what makes an IPA. So for example, in India Pale Ale, if you have an IPA on the west coast, you'll find that it's a little bit more hop forward, whereas an IPA on the East Coast um, is a little bit more malty and balanced. So there's a lot of different understanding um, of what beer is throughout the world, but it truly is a worldwide culture. All right, so this is the part of the presentation where I try to tell you how beer is a lot like yoga. <laughs> right? It's a little bit of an endeavor. Um, so I'm a yoga teacher. I get to do that when I'm not making beer. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, my life is pretty good, but I do. <laughs> so I do get the question a lot, how I reconcile um, making beer and drinking beer with teaching and doing yoga. And for me, um, the answer is really simple. It's moderation. So if you have yoga before beer, you're doing pretty good. But if you have beer before yoga, you might not have that good of a time. I may have experienced that once or twice myself. Um, but really, if you go back to understanding um, why these things actually came about, 
and why they were created, um, it's really easy to see that beer and yoga actually don't have that much of a difference after all. So talking a little bit about the history of beer, um, if we were to go all the way back in time to Mesopotamia, that's where beer was first created, but today we're gonna stick to um, kind of the seventh century European monks um, and their making of beer. So one of the reasons they made beer was to um, make the water drinkable. So back in the seventh century, the water had a lot of really nasty stuff in it, but they found out by making it into beer, they had it drinkable, which is pretty amazing. We all need water in our life. Um, so if we go over to a little bit more in the Eastern world, um, we can see that the creation of yoga, so I can't really see you guys that well, but how many of you have experienced yoga? I see some hands, that's awesome. So I, yeah, again, I'm a yoga teacher, I love it, um, but yoga, how we do it today, is not necessarily how they did yoga um, way 2,000 years ago. So yoga for them was more of a meditative practice. They would sit for hours and hours and hours. They'd meditate and try and get closer to understanding why, we're, why we were here on the planet. It was a pretty lofty goal. But what they found, as you can see from this picture, is when they sat for hours and hours and hours, their bodies started to degrade, started to not look so good for these poor yogis. So what they did was they invented a series of postures um, that we now know as the asana practice of yoga. And this helped stretch and strengthen their bodies so that they were able to sit and practice their spiritual meditation for longer. So yoga we can see as a sustenance for a spiritual practice. Now if we go back to Germany, England, and Belgium, we look at the monks there and start to ask why they were brewing beer. Um, they would practice religious fasts where they would not eat for many, many days in a row. And as you guys again can imagine, if you don't eat for a lot of days in a row, your body starts to degrade. So what they did was they brewed beer. And it's gotten kind of a bad rap these days. Um, beer has calories, we all know that. Beer has carbs, we know that too. Um, but beer also has vitamins and minerals. So these monks would actually use beer while they were fasting, and it was able to allow them to fast for longer. So beer, just like yoga, was a sustenance to a spiritual practice. So if we go all the way back in time, it's pretty easy to see that beer and yoga actually aren't so different after all. And if you don't believe me on that, at least practice moderation. <laughs> so those are just a few of the reasons why I think beer is a truly amazing beverage. Um, but for me, it goes a little bit deeper than that. Beer is what inspired me to leave my comfort zone of Colorado and to move myself out to Davis, California with my little dog in tow. Um, beer is what's introduced me to people that I know, um, that I know I will have in my life for the rest of it. It's given me a path in life that I'm really passionate about. I hope you guys are able to see that by all the science that I, I pulled you through. Um, and it's also something that I'm truly interested in and that I really get to share with people like yourself. So the next time that you're drinking beer, and the next time that you're sitting down with your favorite beer, whether you yet know what that is or not, I hope that you're able to find a newfound appreciation for the beer, whether it's because of its science, its art and creativity, its culture and history, or maybe because it's a little bit like yoga. Thank you so much.